Okay. Resident Evil. This is a game that I have a really awkward history with. Basically, a lot of people grew up with the original version of this game. I did not. I grew up with the GameCube re-release of Resident Evil. And I never got a chance to play the original until very, very recently. Now, I had plenty of chances uh, to go through and play the original on other hardware, but not exactly on PlayStation hardware or even through emulation. It was just not a thing that I ever got around to do. But I want to go through my experience with the Resident Evil series real quick before getting into Resident Evil 1. You see, I started out, like I said, with the GameCube remake, but I was like eight years old when I played that, and let's just go ahead and say, kind of a whiny little bitch, I could not handle that game. I, ju I just couldn't. That game was way, way too scary. Even by the time I was a teenager, I held on to my copy of that game, unable to actually play it. By that time, I had played through Resident Evil 2, three, gotten a significant ways through Code Veronica, and even had beaten four before I was willing to sit down and play the remake of Resident Evil 1 because of how utterly terrifying the thing was. The thing that caused me to be able to finally play through that game was the release of the Nintendo DS version of Resident Evil 1, Resident Evil Deadly Silence. Being able to play through the original, quote, PlayStation release was the thing that made me finally able to actually go through and beat the GameCube version. Now, Deadly Silence has a lot of changes to the original game. Uh, it is, in many cases, its own monster completely, with some changes that are really cool, like first-person fights with zombies uh, that happen with the touchscreen, and some that are really questionable, like being able to touch Jill's boobs and butt and make her freak out at you the same way Ashley did in Resident Evil 4. These are some of the changes that were given in that game, and they do make it its own unique experience, not to mention playing the original Resident Evil on what at the time was considered a very underpowered handheld. Honestly, it was an experience that I want to revisit at some point, but what I have done in recent years is played through the original version of the game, the PlayStation release, and there are some things that made that game very quirky for me before we get into what I just recently played. Now, in the original release, one of the default controls are not auto-aiming your gun at targets, which makes certain fights, like the Tyrant fight, uh, practically impossible if you are not incredibly quick with your fingers. I am very bad at video games, so it take, took me a lot of tries to actually beat the Tyrant when I went through that version of the game. But there is a fabled version of the Resident Evil experience that I had never played, but I heard rumors about. I heard all kinds of things about the Dual Shock re-release of Resident Evil. Now, if you're not a Resident Evil fan, you might not know what this is or what its history is, but let me give a little bit of context. The first PlayStation controller did not have joysticks on it, and thus, when the first release of Resident Evil came out, it didn't work f with joysticks. But eventually, they re-released a version of the game that did work with your joysticks, and that was called the DualShock Edition. But instead of just giving you a new copy of the game that had, you know, ostensibly better controls... I'm sorry, the tank controls of this game really do not work well with the joystick. The D-pads, I still defaulted to the D-pad pretty much my entire way through this game, as much as I could. It just felt a lot better in 90% of cases. But there was one thing that was changed very awkwardly. Now, you can probably hear in the background the music. This is... A very interesting soundtrack for any Resident Evil game, but if, you're, if you've not been acquainted with the soundtrack of this game, I would like to introduce you to the most infamous piece of music that this game has. I would like to introduce you to the basement theme. <laughs> Oh. 
horror game, everybody. We're trying to scare you. I'm sure for somebody, farting clowns is incredibly terrifying, but... Now, I know that that sounds very, very strange, but we need to talk about how music was produced on these old systems. You see, back in the day, you weren't able to really store music on your CDs or on your game cartridges because music takes up a lot of space. Uh, just throwing it out there, 3 to 8 megabytes for a good looping musical track is pretty normal, considering that you at that time might have wanted to have, oh, 50 different songs for your OST, but only 700 megabytes of space on your disc. Yeah, you're not going to fit all that on there and also put a fucking game on. There is no way that you're managing that. But I want to introduce you to something real quick. This is the Resident Evil DualShock basement theme fixed. Now, there is something awkward about this theme. And it's not the actual music itself, it's not the composition, it's the instrument that has been chosen to be used. But there is this version which only changes the instruments being used, and it's still being played in MIDI format. Now, the reason this matters is because when we make music now for games, we have an orchestra do it, we record it, and we slap that shit on the disc, and we're good. Back then, the console had to have a sound chip that generated the music itself. There are certain consoles around these times that did not have sound chips, like the Game Boy Advance, and that's why its music all sounds like garbage. But let me introduce you to what happens when you take that exact MIDI file and you play it with different instruments. This is the exact same file. This has been done by a user named Apple uh, Agent Red Jackal on YouTube. And it's the same composition. Nothing has changed. All that has changed is effectively the sound font which is essentially the digital instruments being used to play the game. That's it. That is all it is. And yet when you hear this version of the soundtrack, it is remarkably different, way more creepy, and infinitely more fitting to the actual type of game that Resident Evil is, honestly. Oh no, structuralism. But we'll go back to the regular soundtrack, because I want to point out something. I have been used to playing this game with its, uh, with its original soundtrack and with its remake soundtrack for years now, because the original soundtrack is present in Deadly Silence. And the regular soundtrack that I'm used to is present in the remake that's on the GameCube and on Steam. I'm used to those. This was my first experience with this interesting soundtrack. Now, the fable is that the person who wrote this soundtrack, quote-unquote, wrote it, uh, actually had a ghostwriter doing the entire thing, uh, and also claimed to be deaf. Now, I'm not 100% certain how true all of the myths surrounding this game's soundtrack and composition are, but I do know that it became known as the worst soundtrack in the whole series. But as I started playing through it, well, just listen to this sound right here. This is the moment you meet Rebecca Chambers as Chris Redfield. It doesn't sound bad, does it? Here. I'll turn it up for you a little bit. Honestly, it's not bad. And what I found is that the longer I played through this game the more its soundtrack started to grow on me, it didn't sound as... <sighs> What's the best word for it? Cinematic? As the soundtrack that we got in the original game? But there's a quality to it. It makes me feel almost like if a Pokemon game had a horror soundtrack, this is about what they would be going for. And I don't mind it. I actually think that I'm starting to prefer this soundtrack for the game. 
like, I know that for a lot, and, and I know I'm spending a lot of time on the soundtrack itself, but this is the most infamous part of the DualShock version of the game. I think I legitimately enjoy this soundtrack more than the original, the longer that I listen to it. Granted, Clowns Farting in the Basement is probably one of the only exceptions to that rule, but a lot of the soundtrack is just really good. But we've talked about the soundtrack for a little while. I said, how the fuck did we get up to 170 hours? Uh, well, the subathon uh, is doing what the subathon does. Leet and Boobs got us here. But now I want to talk about something that's not music composition. Let's talk about the game itself. Yeah, it's 10 minutes in talking about a game that I just played. Let's go ahead and finally talk about the video game itself. What is Resident Evil? This is a survival horror game. One of the earliest ones to exist. It's kind of loosely based off of the structure of an older game called Sweet Home, for those who don't know. But for the most part, it is one of the earliest examples of a horror game that we have that really does its best to try to scare the player. Now, we had games with horror themes before. Games like, say, Castlevania, where all the characters look like you went into a Halloween town and, you know ripped all of the costumes off the rack and put them on a bunch of mannequins, and there's your enemies you're fighting in the Castlevania series. They're not really scary. But Resident Evil is scary. Or at least it was. I would say that the remake has definitely surpassed this game in terms of what it actually accomplishes as far as making an atmosphere that makes you afraid, but the game legitimately scared the shit out of people back in the day. Also, I don't know why I was standing there letting bees attack me. That was uh, not a very smart thing for me to do during this playthrough. But, the fact of the matter is, as one of the earliest examples of a survival horror game, there are some things the game does that are both a product of the game trying to make itself more scary for you, and a product of its time. You've probably noticed that there are fixed camera angles throughout this playthrough. There is no camera panning. Cameras don't move. That is the ceiling trap theme. That's a little much. <laughs> I don't hate it, but it's a, again, it's a little much. But these fixed camera angles are because the game uses pre-rendered backdrops for its environment. It basically means instead of a 3D environment the same way that you would get in a game like, say, Mario 64... This is a series of 2D environments that are all layered on top of one another. Uh, in fact, actually, what I'm doing right now is the exact same thing if you look at where I am. I'm in a 2D environment. The backdrop behind me? That's a video file, playing on loop. The thing in front of me? That's a picture in Photoshop. And I can move myself around because I'm not really here. That's all just perspective. That's all just different layers of art doing their job, making it seem like I'm actually here. But I'm not, in any way, shape, or form. There is no digital environment before uh, behind me. I can't put myself through it. It is a video file that will loop infinitely and never change. No matter how much you want to explore Click Clock Wood, you're going to have to boot up Banjo-Kazooie to do it. Can't do it in this video. Resident Evil works on the exact same principle. Instead of actually having 3D environments, you have layers of 2D images smacked on top of one another to simulate the idea of a 3D environment, and it works really well. But controlling in an environment like that can be kind of weird. The camera snaps around everywhere. So do you do what Mario 64 does and set the controls up so that when you press right on the right uh, on the D-pad, you go right? No. Back then, they had this idea that if the character was moving forward and the camera changed, then, well, the controls needed to change with the camera angle, not maintain regardless of what way you'd be pushing. So the way they got around this was by having you use tank controls, which means that when you press forward on the D-pad, you move forward. But when you press left and right, you rotate on your axis, and that's it. Now, it feels really clunky at first, but I'm going to be honest. Anybody who, can, who complains about tank controls in the Resident Evil games, the more you sit down and play with them, the more you adjust to them. And honestly, they feel perfectly fine over time. Also, Striker, thank you very much for redeeming your points for an... Arara, you fucking monster. 
but the tank controls are something you get used to. Now to mention, the game has an auto-aim feature that allows you, whenever there is an enemy present, to snap your gun to the enemy itself. So if you're worried about what the auto-aim, or how you're actually going to aim at enemies in this environment when your controls are so gimped, you'll be fine. The game will automatically make it so that you can hit those enemies. You can even snap to a bunch of different creatures by using a different button without even getting out of your aim stance, which is going to be very helpful when you are swarmed by three or four creatures. The game can't handle putting more creatures at you than these ones. Also, speaking of music tracks, this one that's playing near uh, in the background right now, this is the music that plays right before you meet Forrest, one of your downed Stars team members. This music, because I already knew that I was approaching Forrest's uh, area and I was about to get his grenade launcher, this music recontextualized that whole meeting for me. It feels very unsettling. And it made me un it made me unsettled even though I knew that I was about to see Forest. I knew what section of the game I was going to, but this track in the background right now is one of the reasons I think I actually really enjoy the DualShock soundtrack. Again, I know most Resident Evil players hate it, but I'm, I'm sorry. I just like it a lot. But continuing on with Resident Evil is, is Resident Evil a game where you're going to be fighting a lot of monsters? Absolutely. Is it a game where you should? Probably not. Your first time through, you're probably going to waste a lot of ammo going through, and you're going to find yourself in the middle of a boss fight with a handful of pistol rounds and a knife and a prayer and your butt cheeks clenched very, very hard. Now on this playthrough, by the time I got to the end, I had about 18 shotgun shells available to me. I had about the same amount of grenade launcher shells available a handful of extra clips, and 24 magnum rounds, not counting the six that were sitting inside my magnum itself, and my knife had never been used except for one instance where I needed to cut spider webs off of a wall. But that's because your first time through this game, it's a horror game. It's going to scare the piss out of you, and you're going to get really, really flabbergasted with the lack of resources the game throws at you. But your second time through, there's some things that you probably will remember. One, you probably accidentally shot off a zombie's head with a shotgun once. You can do that throughout the entire game. Two, you've probably gotten a situation where you didn't have any weapon except your handgun to handle a hunter. But what's that? How many bullets does it take to kill a hunter? Seven. How many bullets does it take to kill a zombie? Seven. How many shotgun shells does it take to kill a hunter? Three. How many shotgun shells does it take to kill a zombie? One. Now you see what I'm getting at. As you start to figure out which weapons in almost a rock, paper, scissors sense work better against different enemies, you start to basically equip the weapons that are going to handle each individual instance of a battle better. You stop using the pistol on zombies, and you use it exclusively on dogs and hunters. You stop using the shotgun on dogs and hunters, and start using it exclusively on zombies. This allows you to spread your ammo in such a way that lets you stockpile a crap ton of it, so that you're basically free with how you want to go about the entire game. This is not something that you're going to do your first time through. You're probably not even going to remember those uh, numbers that I threw at you, or any of the other ones that the game will have later. But there's all kinds of intricacy to the combat in terms of which ammo you bring to which fight. Depending on the composition of your enemy, it may be a better idea to bring a grenade launcher with you. When you get to the end of the game, chimeras can take five shotgun shots to kill, but the concussive power of a grenade launcher can really kill them in a single shot. But hunters can sometimes take two shots with a grenade launcher to kill. Probably don't want to use them on their beefy forms. But chimeras are literally made of genetically altered flies. Their exoskeletons can't handle concussive force, so use the grenade launcher. Again, these are not things you're going to remember in the beginning, but they are things that you will keep with you through subsequent playthroughs, which will make every playthrough of the game infinitely easier for you. Speaking of those playthroughs, you have two available to you. You have Jill Valentine and you have Chris Redfield. I chose to go through this game as Jill Valentine because honestly, I kind of prefer her campaign to Chris's. Chris's is a little clunky. In Jill, the advantages you have are, you get a, wow. 
That part of the soundtrack actually got a little obnoxious. <laughs> um, but, but, during the playthrough with Jill, you get a lockpick. And that lockpick allows you to basically carte blanche your way through a whole lot of obstacles that you really can't do with Chris. With, with Chris, to do the exact same thing, you need to collect small keys, which means your inventory is a lot more limited when playing as Chris. But there is an advantage. As Jill, you basically have to keep a healing item on you at all times because, well, if you get hit once, you're probably two hits away from death. As Chris, you can actually handle a lot more hits in combat, and it allows you to kind of tank your way through parts of the game that you otherwise wouldn't be able to, things that Jill simply can't do. Chris is just better at combat than Jill, but storyline-wise, there are hiccups where Chris is concerned. When you get to the fight uh, with Yon, you have assistance from Barry in terms of handing you a rope and letting you jump down that you really don't have with... Chris. When you are playing as Chris, he can't play the piano, so you have to wait for another character named Rebecca Chambers to do a piano playing segment to open a locked door. Jill knows how to play the piano, so she gets to go through those bits herself. When you want to get the shotgun, as Chris, you have to wait extra long to get it because you're going to have to find a broken shotgun and use that to get your way through. There's a puzzle that tries to kill you if you take the shotgun off a wall and don't replace it with a dummy. But as Jill, you can just kind of blitz through that entire thing. Because as Jill, you can just use Barry. Barry will come and rescue you from that scenario. These are things that mean that if you're playing the game, I really would recommend going through as Jill first, and then going through as Chris later. Because Chris recontextualizes a lot of stuff in that game for your second playthrough. If you want to play through as Chris first, go right ahead. It will make playing through as Jill a breeze later. But that's just my suggested way of going through. The game also has multiple endings. Now, I mentioned that there's a whole bunch of enemies that you have to fight, and the ways that you have to beat them is very rock, paper, scissory with the different weapons the game gives you. But the different endings... This is another thing that will make you want to go through the game multiple times to see these recontextualized things. You can go through the game and be the only survivor of your force. As far as the amount of people that are alive in this mansion, you have you, the player, as either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine. And then you've got Barry Burton, Wesker, or Albert Wesker. You have Enrico and Rebecca Chambers. And there's also Richard as well, but... Um, well, I don't want to spoil Richard. You can save him for a time. Don't worry. A certain number of these characters will make it through to the end, depending on how you play through the game, depending on what choices you make and which items you, you actually get. As you play through the game, you might find that there are certain endings that you will or will not have. And as you learn things about certain characters in the game, you may choose which ones you actually want to keep alive based on... Uh, how they've treated you in previous playthroughs. Now, it's nothing as intricate as, say, like an Undertale playthrough or anything like that. The endings are very simple. It literally just comes down to who gets to live in the end. That's it. But for the time that this game came out, that was a lot. The closest thing we had to this back then was something like Chrono Trigger, uh, which Chrono Trigger had a lot more endings, but it was also an RPG, not a horror game going for something like this. I've said this before, and I'll say it again about good Resident Evil games. All good Resident Evil games are survival horror games the first time you play them, and min-maxing arcade funhouses the second time you play. The fear dissipates when you know what's around every single corner, but that rock paper scissory combat is still there in full force once you know what you're doing. This incentivizes multiple playthroughs. I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of games that I just simply will not play through again because the games don't give me anything new when I go for a second playthrough. The Resident Evil series, though, I've never had this problem with. Every single time you play through the game again, there's always going to be the same obstacles, but you have the option to tackle them in different ways. Depending on the ways you choose to tackle them, you may have very different resources available to you compared to previous playthroughs. But... 
This does bring me to one of the conclusions I have had about this game. Is it worth it to play this version? Now, I chose to play the DualShock version because I'm going through the original versions of these games, and I had never played the DualShock one, and I was super interested in what the soundtrack was like. And again, I actually found that I really enjoyed the soundtrack. I'm going to keep on playing it in the background. It's what I've used this whole time throughout the entirety of the video. I know that it's uh, bouncing around in volume because I'm terrible at doing these live, but here you go. I really and truly think that it's not worth it to play this game. And I know that I've been singing its praises and talking about all the really neat stuff the game does for you, but going back and playing it again, this version of the game specifically, I actually don't think there's a way or there's a reason to play it at all. Honestly, the reason for that is there are two superior versions of this game that exist. If you want to get the original experience with the original map layout and bad voice acting and the original endings and the rock, paper, scissory combat and the way that I described, then get the DS game. The DS game has an original mode and a deadly silence mode, basically letting you play through the game the way it was originally intended and then the way that the DS version recontextualizes it. It lets you do both. Honestly, because of that and that alone, I can't suggest playing this game. I love it to death. I enjoyed every minute of this extra playthrough, and I even died a few times because it still manages to surprise you in certain places. Some of those areas are a little cheaper than others, like uh, when the hunters come in and they corner you in one area, and they there are no invincibility frames, so think about the worst time you've been comboed in, a, in any game by Capcom and multiply that by five, and yeah, that's what the hunters can do to you, and that kind of sucks. But barring that... I think the game is still fun. I just don't think there's a reason to play this version. Outside of the novelty of the wacky-ass DualShock soundtrack? Honestly? Either play the original or play the DS version if you desperately want this game. And I would just stick to the DS version in any case. I don't see a reason not to play it. The only thing that the DS version does not do well is render its environments. The environments in the DS version of the game are a little washed out compared to the versions in the PlayStation. That's it. That's the only downside. Everything else is pitch perfect. And then there's that remake. And I want to do a video on the Resident Evil 1 remake at some point. But there is absolutely zero reason to play this game when the remake exists. Now, when I get to Resident Evil 2, I'm going to have a very different take on that. I really am. But the original versions of this game exist only as novelties now. The remake functionally replaces this in every way, shape, or form, because it recreates everything about this game, but scales it up increases the complexity of everything in it tenfold while not actually making it too hard for the player to, to handle. Puzzles that uh, are, are very, very quick one-and-done things in the original game are broadened and uh, realized a lot more heavily in the remake. The graphics and voice acting are infinitely better. They still use the pre-rendered backdrops with the cinematic angles, so it's not like you're getting a different game. When we get to Resident Evil 2... I'm not going to have this same take, because I don't think the Resident Evil 2 remake replaces the original game. But with RE1, as much as I love it, as much as I think that you really should play it at some point if you haven't for the novelty factor alone, if I'm giving a game recommendation to somebody, if I'm trying to convince somebody that there's a game that they haven't played yet that they really need to give a shot, this isn't it. And I hate saying that. Because again, this is one of the most pivotal pieces of media that has ever been released in terms of the horror genre. This game spawned another series entirely due solely to wanting to compete with it. If you like the Silent Hill series, thank Resident Evil. That series exists literally because Konami wanted the ability to compete with the Resident Evil series. None of that would have happened had we not gotten this first game first. So it is a piece of history. 
but it's just not a piece of history that I think you need to play outside of that novelty factor. Despite me absolutely loving it to death. Do I think the game still holds up? Oh, absolutely, I do. It may look like a piece of garbage, but all the aspects that make it good are still there. The problem is that all those aspects are modernized in the GameCube and PC re-releases of this game. I do want to see this game ported to Steam at some point, just so people have the ability to have that there for the, for the sole purpose of game preservation. But outside of collecting, just no. Now granted, I would like to see something happen like what happened with the Resident Evil 2 remake where you can play the original game's soundtrack even in the remake. I would love if this game's soundtrack, specifically the DualShock soundtrack, were able to be played through the lens of the remake. Even though the remake is a, is a masterpiece of a horror game and has cinema off the wazoo well over and above what this version of the game has, I would love to get it with that kooky DualShock soundtrack. And I know there's modders who have probably managed to make this happen. But I'm going to be honest. Outside of the Plant 42 soundtrack telling me that I uh, really, really do not want to fight Plant 42 again with the pistol. I want to see the soundtrack ported in other games because it is a piece of history. And I like it a lot. And there's probably a lot of stuff that I'm missing where this game is concerned. I've went over the Rock, Paper, Scissors con uh, combat. I've gone over its place in history. About the only thing I haven't covered is the story. And honestly, there's not a whole lot there in this game. This is very much a foundational game of the Resident Evil series' is concern. I can go over it very briefly. The STARS team members, uh, you as Jill Valentine, Chris Redfield, Albert Wesker, Barry Burton, and Joseph Frost, all find your way into the Arclay Mountains trying to find the Alpha Team. When you try to find the Alpha Team, you find that they have all been in various states of either uh, MIA, dismembered, dead, or, uh, well, in Rebecca's case, here, but fuck that shit. You find out later that the STARS team is actually one of the most elite squads that the Raccoon City Police Department has to throw at any particular problem. And because of that, the Umbrella Corporation wants to use them to gather combat data for the various creatures that are being sold on the black market that they're developing in their Arclay Mountain facility. The entire idea is for you to die here. You were sent here solely for the purpose of gathering combat data for a ruthless corporation. Now you have to try to find your way out. And there's a lot of other twists and turns that happen in the story, like getting betrayed by Albert Wesker, finding out which members of the Alpha Team did or didn't survive, and, well, in canon, you as Chris, Jill, Barry, and Rebecca all survive because they make it to other games. But past that, there's not a lot that happens here. Infinitely more story happens in Resident Evil 2 and 3, and those stories are a lot more fun to pick apart and just kind of play through and talk about. There's more characters, more interactions. There's just not a lot here in this original version of the story. This really exists to set up the universe of Resident Evil. That's not what it was there for in the beginning. This was meant to be a standalone game. There was no thoughts of having a sequel or anything like that. But the barebones story that it has is kind of a product of the time that it was released in. And even the remakes of the game still use this very barebones approach to its story, even though they add extra fl uh, bits of flavor, like the addition of Lisa Trevor, who, if you've seen the trailer for the new Resident Evil movie, looks absolutely stunning in the new Resident Evil movie. Oh, and here we have the cutscene where the hunter comes. This is most of what you get in terms of story in this game. Random new enemy gets introduced, and you have to figure out how to deal with random new enemy outside of the stuff that happens with Barry. If you want a more story-centric version of this game, play the remake. It adds way more stuff, especially in the notes and everything else that's there, that this version of the game simply does not have. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. This was a foundational piece, and it has been functionally replaced as a starting point for the series. I still enjoy it. I still recommend it as a collector's piece and as a novelty. But I honestly can't wait till we can talk about the remake of this game. Because if there's any version of this game that I think you should play, it's that. I'm not going to give a numerical score to this thing. 
I really think that those are all arbitrary and pulled out of reviewers' asses, and honestly, I'm super happy that most people who do game reviews have stopped doing that on the whole on YouTube. And I know that this is not the most well-put-together review, because this is, well, like with all the other reviews on this channel, these are my organic thoughts directly after playing this game, literally minutes after doing so. So, this is what you got. If anything, it's as honest to take as you'll ever find. But that said, I do hope you enjoyed this take. I know that this is more of just a conversation and less a structured review, but in light of it being a conversation, maybe let's start one down in the comment section below. Have you played this game? Is this something that's part of your childhood? It wasn't able to be part of mine. Do you have any disagreements with what I've said here? Do you think that this is something that all gamers should give a try uh, outside of its purpose as a novelty? I want to know what you think, and I want to know if you think the game still holds up. With that said, though, I think I've pretty much said my piece where this is concerned. I hope I'm going to be able to get to Resident Evil 2 in time before Halloween is over. I don't know if I'll really manage that, but we'll see. We'll see. With that said, everyone, hit the like button if you haven't already, subscribe if you haven't already, and as always, insert into video tagline here. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. It really means a lot to me. If you want access to behind the scenes content for the channel, please consider checking out my Patreon. I do weekly vlogs over there where I give uh, real life updates to what's going on behind the scenes on the channel, stuff that you don't really get uh, over here and, and even on Twitch. Uh, Patreon also helps the channel's stability a whole lot. Without Patreon, I wouldn't be able to do this at all. Especially with the kind of content that I do, neither YouTube nor Twitch are the most stable sources of income. If you are a $20 and up patron, then you will be featured on the ending slides as shown in the beginning of the end credits. If you want to catch the streams where all this content comes from, then consider heading over to Twitch and following. And if you want to continue watching over here on YouTube, maybe consider clicking one of the end screen videos. And once again, I want to thank you so much for spending your time with me over on my channel. I wouldn't be able to do literally anything that I'm doing over here on YouTube without each and every one of you. So thank you.